Welcome to the Connected Conversation with Brett Hill, a well-known mindfulness and somatic coach and coach trainer, as he demonstrates the power of mindful communication to change your life, work, and the world. Disconnected is the new normal. People are feeling overdriven, overwhelmed, and disconnected from meaningful conversations. But it doesn't have to be that way. Step into a life that works for you. Flourish and give voice to your natural creativity and purpose as you learn how to connect deeply and authentically with yourself, others, and the world. The Connected Conversation with Brett Hill starts now. So welcome to The Connected Conversation. I'm Brett Hill. I'm a mindful somatic coach, which is kind of a mouthful, uh, and coach trainer. And my passion in life and is mindful communications and i've had the privilege of learning with some of the best teachers trainers therapists coaches meditation instructors mindfulness trainers in the world and i've just um it's added so much richness to the quality of my life and my career uh, because I actually have had a technical career. I worked at Microsoft and other companies and, and and it made, made such a big difference to the way I, I've been able to engage with, you know, my colleagues, my relationships, my or the organizations that I'm with. It's just added so much richness that I just, I'm kind of on a mission these days to to spread the word because it's uh, if I sometimes I'll say like if people knew just what doing a little bit of work in the world of being more mindful and present with others when you're speaking and talking, um, what it would do for you if you had an idea if I could drop that into your world for like thought for like thirty minutes in in a in a day where you're kind of active. It would change your world so much. It would that you'd go, oh my God, how did I ever live without this? And and uh, and that's why I get so excited about um, these topics and this particular mission and created the podcast. So today's episode is focusing on a really, uh, you know, in the world of mindfulness, you, it's kind of like the idea of controversy and mindfulness is. They don't quite go together. It's not like drama, big drama often, but you'd be surprised. And in that world, there, um, this is one of the topics that comes up from time to time. And so I just want to tackle this head on and um, make this episode about the topic of can mindfulness be harmful? And if you Google that, you'll find lots of different articles around this. And um, I've like I mentioned a minute ago, I've been the beneficiary of some amazing training from um, incredible therapists. One of them um, was Pat Ogden of the Sensory Motor Institute. She was the, um, who founded the Sensory Motor Institute. But before then, she studied um, a type of therapy and was a trainer, um, one of the co-founders of the Helcomi Institute. Back in the day, I had the opportunity to, to do uh, some work with her. And I want to frame it like I was like a colleague and we were doing peer work. I was a student and um, I definitely learned some amazing things from her back then. And then also um, from Ron Kurtz, who was the founder of the Hakomi Institute, um, which is a mindful somatic approach to psychotherapy. And I've kind of framed all that now into a coaching framework where which I call the mindful coach method which is a whole other topic but but the reason I want to mention this is is just to say I've got some you know uh, background in this and and um but, but I also want to say very clearly I'm not a therapist and I'm not credentialed in any you know certified way to be an expert on the topic of um trauma I have studied with people who were. And so that said, the the way we talk about that kind of position in the world is trauma-informed. And so there's a thing these days called trauma-informed mindfulness. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Now, why is that important? So let's kind of put a peg right there and go, why is this even an important conversation? First of all, 
when people start to get interested in mindfulness, and, and we're talking about mindfulness in the connected conversation, because really we're talking about being present while with your own experience and the experience of another person while you're talking. And this sounds like it's a, it sounds like a lot. Well, how can I do all of that? It's like a lot going on. It's actually much easier than you think if you just kind of drop a lot of the, the ideas about what we ought to be doing and simply just notice. Notice how you're feeling. Notice what's being said to you. Notice the way this other person feels to you and how what goes on in you as a result. When you know, just simply are in a state of noticing and open curiosity, and then a whole lot more becomes possible than if you're, you've got this back channel in your head going, well, I hope I'm saying the right thing. And I really want to be clever, or I'm afraid, or I really want to impress it. If you've got all that going on, you can't really be present with someone because you're really being present with your, the chatter in your head, right? Now, a lot of people, that's the way it goes all the time but they're not aware of it. And that's the opposite of mindfulness, not being aware of what's going on. So the reason what, hap what happens is when you decide, you know, I really would like to have this more connected, deeper, you know, juicier, intimate, um, open, vulnerable kind of conversation with people whenever it's possible, because let's be real about that. It's not always possible, right? not even always desirable, but frequently, hey, wouldn't you like more of that in your life? Yes, of course. So what happens whenever people start to, to, to do this work, they seek out and they say, oh, I'm going to study mindfulness, and that's going to help. And for the vast majority of people, that is true. So I just, let's just start with that. And that's that most people would benefit dramatically from a mindfulness practice of any sort. It's a legitimate mindfulness practice, not, not something that you're, you're learning from someone who isn't versed in what mindfulness really is. And there are, all, there are some people out there who kind of really don't know that much about it, um, acting like they do. And so you want to find somebody who's, you know, got a structured, informed uh, approach to what they're doing and it sounds good. And there's a whole FAQ I'm going to do later on, you know, how you can sort that out a little bit. So the first thing that happens when you start to do a mindfulness practice is you start to turn your attention to your inner world. Now, that sounds simple in a way. It's like, but, what, but because we're doing it in a very um, intentional way and bringing a lot more attention to it than you normally do. So it's not like, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. It's more like, hey, how you doing? I don't know. Let me find out. And you stop for a second and you check in with yourself. This is actually a technique I call letting the world come to you. I wasn't planning on talking about that today, but since we are, it's like when someone says, hello, how you doing? You have the moment to let the world prompt you to actually be mindful and find out how am I actually doing rather than just being automatic about it. Because typically that's what happens. We're on automatic. And being mindful is the practice of interrupting those automatic processes. So you turn inside and you just go, oh, what's going on? How am I feeling? Oh, I'm feeling tense. I'm feeling kind of buzzed because I'm speaking to you. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. That's just there. And you, the trick is to simply notice and name the experience. Notice, oh, I'm feeling that. Oh, I'm anxious. Oh, I'm a little hyper driven. Yeah, I'm going to take a breath and relax and settle a moment. Oh, and behind that, usually what happens when you do that is another layer is revealed. Oh, behind all that is this desire to is, is this desire to actually be um you know helpful and useful to you and so there's this sense in me of i'm really wanting to be uh helpful to people and that's kind of pushing me some now another thing that can happen all those things i named are like 
perfectly legit and good things, I think. And the other thing that can happen is that you take a look in there and it's not so pleasant. It's like, man, I'm having like so much. Oh my God, I've got so much tension, anxiety, sadness, depression. Something that isn't quite as experience as as great to experience. And when you do turn to that, there can be this sort of like, well, whoa. Uh, you know, I don't know if I want to go in that dirty bedroom, you know, that messed up room. It's kind of like the room inside you, <laughs> if you think of it that way, as your as your inner world, like your the house you live in. And we're kind of always looking out the window. And you take a moment, you turn around and you look in the house, and you go, no, I'm going back to the window because it's nicer out there. <laughs> That's very frequently what happens to people when they begin to first look inside in a serious way. The fact that things are a little unpleasant can become um, uh, disturbing. And this is just the beginning of the conversation around, you, there's disturbing. So if I was to have this on a scale of like one to 10, there's disturbing like, yeah, you know, that's, I don't, it doesn't feel great to feel that anxiety or that, that, uh, annoyance or that oppression or guilt or shame or all, I'm, I'm naming a lot of negative things, but hey, those are those are things that are actually a part of our lives. There's a sense there's like being annoyed, and then there's being overwhelmed. There's like as soon as I begin to look at that, it's like it's not just that it feels a little icky; it feels horrifying or terrifying or overwhelming that's when we begin to enter into this world of a trauma response and there's a big big difference in how these things show up in us um, not only in the real world in terms of interacting with the world and how it impacts us but neurologically and we're going to talk about that um, the difference between you know, what happens to us in, this, in the ways that we kind of feel, you know, what you might say kind of within the range of normally unhappy or normally disgruntled, uh, even if they're patterned in a sense of like, and you walk around going, well, I'm kind of an unhappy person most of the time. That's quote unquote normal in the sense that you can see it all over the place, right? Um that's different than someone who is um, traumatized in a way where um, they they don't really have um, control of their experience, even if they wish to, um, because of the way it's, we're going to call it the wounding that happened to them, happened in such a way that it really goes much deeper than your normal sort of so what i'm really talking about are um what you might call categories of wounding and there's just normal sort of everyday things like i fell off the bicycle and oh ow that hurts and i don't really like feeling that pain but that's what's really happening versus you have a head-on collision and you're in the hospital right those are different kinds of experiences but they're and when either one of those people starts to turn in and go, what's my experience like? One person is going to go, yeah, that was unpleasant. Another person is going, oh, my God, that was crazy. And I, the next time I see a, another bicycle coming at me, you know, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to stop and flee because it's so scary. That's a different kind of thing completely. We're going to talk some more about that in a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to um, get through that piece and we'll come back and have some more about can mindfulness be harmful in a moment? Hey, this is Brett. Welcome back to the Connected Conversation, where today we are talking about trauma-informed mindfulness. And another way to ask is, which comes out of the question, can mindfulness be harmful? And we were talking about the difference between sort of normal emotional woundedness like somebody says something bad to you and you feel bad about it or it might go deeper than that like maybe your mother and father were mean to you and that actually caused you some some challenges um and then there's trauma which is a completely different 
scenario. And we're talking about this in this way because um, we're the question is, can mindfulness be unhelpful in, in specific situations? And what are those situations? And what do you do about it? So I'm trying to set the stage here for understanding that when you go inside and start to look at your experience, which is the literal essence of what mindfulness is about, it's simply being present with your experience in the moment. Now, I want to drill in a little bit on the definition uh, or what is widely accepted as the definition of mindfulness by John Kabat-Zinn, who was considered by many to be sort of the grandfather of mindfulness in the U.S. Uh, you know, mindfulness has roots in Buddhism and has been, and John Kabat-Zinn is accredited with bringing that over to the United States. And even though his organizations, the Insight Meditation Center's um, they have you know, sort of Buddhist roots, and you'll still find, um, you know, associations of Buddhism in those uh, organizations and in those trainings. Um, it's not a straight up a religious practice. It's not like a Buddhist practice uh, with the with the, and because there's a lot that goes along with. A mindfulness from a Buddhist point of view. There's a a lot of um, um, what's what I want to say? There's a lot of um, um, learning in terms of those the layers and the the, the depths, and it goes it goes deep and it goes far. Uh, and it's I personally think it's great stuff, but it's the practice itself doesn't have to have that in order for you to benefit from it. And so, consequently, John Kabat-Zinn said, "Well, let's just take all that away and." see what we can help people do to give them the benefits of the practice without having to adopt uh, a Buddhism, right? And so it became a secular, or let's say a more secular approach to helping benefit people. And that became mindfulness-based stress, excuse me, mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, often called MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is very, very widely taught, and you can find courses in all over the place, and it's great stuff, and I recommend it. Now, his definition uh, is um, paying, paying attention in a particular way, and there's three main components. On purpose, I'm just going to stop right there, because that means that if you're going to be mindful, you have an intention to be mindful and you're aware of making a choice to be mindful. So I'm so in my world here with the connected conversation, it's like I'm going to make a choice to be present with somebody. I'm going to look at them. I'm going to say, take a breath. I'm going to make a, a choice to be present and show up with more focused, conscious attention than I would normally. Because if I don't do that, I'm just being on automatic. And that I'm not saying that to be negative. I'm just saying that's just what happens. Someone walks in the room and they say, hey, how's it going? And I just say, oh, great. And I turn around and go back to what I'm doing. I'm just doing automatic. Someone walks in the room. I look at them and I say, I'm just going to take a moment. I'm going to notice them. I'm going to say, oh, there's Jeff. Jeff is, you know, he's looking kind of stressed. I'm feeling that. And then I might say, hey, how's it going, Jeff? And you can feel the connection of me having care and concern about Jeff versus, hey, it's fine, I'm going back to what I'm doing. In one case, I'm making an intentional choice to be mindful in the conversation. And that changes the conversation. So that's just point one, on purpose. Now, in the moment is the other thing. So on purpose in the moment. So when you are on purpose in the moment, making a connection or being present with your being mindful. What that means is I'm not thinking about something that happened yesterday or that I'm, I'm anticipating for tomorrow. Now there's nothing wrong with that. And in, and in fact, one of the FAQs I, I have about mindfulness um, is you know, there's a sort of negativity sometimes around thinking about the future. Like you can't even think about it somehow. It's like wrong to have this idea about what's going to happen tomorrow. And it's not. The difference is you want to be able to be present when you wish to be and not 
always wondering about what am I going to be doing tomorrow? What's going to my concern? I'm worried about X. Uh, there's an event coming and I can't get my mind off of it. It's a week from now. And all I can do is think about it. that happens, right? It happens all the time. Um, some people live their whole lives like that. And, you know, hey, that's not a great place to be because you wind up missing the beauty of what's right in front of you because you're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's really kind of the essence of the value of mindfulness in a lot of ways. And so <clears throat> paying attention on purpose in the moment, and then also, and this is really kind of the hardest part, non-judgmentally. Now, what does that mean? And this is also a big FAQ. You know, um, and I'll put the, a link, by the way, to these FAQs on the Connected Conversation website. So if you go to theconnectedconversation.com after the show, you'll find a link to these FAQs, which I wrote um, earlier uh, for my other website at uh, bretthill.coach. And you'll it's a decent FAQ, actually. Oh, actually, now that I mentioned it, you can find them at uh, mindfulnessfaq.com, mindfulnessfaq.com. Um, and so I actually took and made a website out of them. <laughs> and hopefully they'll be useful to you. So mindfulnessfaq.com, go there, and you'll find most all of these points. So coming back to the point of being non-judgmental. Now, being non-judgmental does not mean that you don't have a preference or that you don't declare boundaries in your life. What it means is being open and curious rather than, um, let's just put it like this, suspending judgment, right? So let's say I, I begin to be in, look inside and I feel all this anxiety about, am I good enough? I don't feel like I'm good enough. I'll never be good enough. And that's like a thought in my head and a feeling in my body. And the the meaning that I make out of that is, oh, I can't do this mindful stuff at all. I'm just no good as I don't know what I'm doing. That's the meaning that you're making out of this. The, in that case, you're kind of judging yourself as being unfit or incapable or unworthy. That's being judgmental. Being non-judgmental is saying, I'm noticing that this is going on with me that I'm having a thought process and feelings that I don't feel good about myself. That's just naming what is true. And I don't mean it's true that you're unworthy, but you're, it's true that you're having that experience. There's a part of you that is going, you don't really know what you're doing and you're never going to get this. And why do you think you could even manage? This is a very common situation for people. And so if that's you, one of the advices I would give to you as a coach and in mindfulness training as well is to take a moment and simply notice and name that experience as something that's going on in you rather than who you are. Huge, huge difference right there. It's something that's going on in you rather than who you are. I'm having these negative thoughts, these negative feelings, these judgmental thoughts about myself. Oh, that's a part of who I am. It's not that you are unworthy or you are, it's just a thought process. And it's really, is, is uh, I don't mean to, to kind of devalue the impact, but it's really nothing more than a thought a habitual thought process. It's just a circuit in your brain. And you can, you can change that, right? It's just that we don't ever take time to look and see what's going on there. And therefore, when you do, it starts to feel like, oh, that, that's kind of yucky. I don't really like that. But if you practice instead taking a breath and noticing, oh, yeah. So remember, I was using the metaphor of the house, the dirty house, right? So, oh, yeah, my kitchen is a mess. So the kitchen is a mess. And so what happens next? You just name, oh, the kitchen is a mess versus I can't keep up with this. It's overwhelming. There's so much going on and I just don't know how to keep up. You know, those are two very different experiences. So in a certain way, we're talking about just objectively 
naming and noticing what is so. Now, this opens a very, very big door, a very massive big door, because in that moment of being aware of what is so, you begin to have the opportunity to make a different choice. I think there was the, uh, that's just landing right straight up in the Viktor Frankl quote about, you know, between stimulus and response, I'm not going to get the exact quote right, but in between stimulus and response, there is a opportunity, there's a moment there, and there's a pause. And in that pause is the opportunity to choose. And in that choice, there's freedom. And so here you can begin to have the opportunity to make a different choice than you would normally. Now, how does this all relate to can mindfulness be harmful? It's because sometimes you turn around and you look back at your house and it's on fire. <laughs> and you go, whoa, whoa. I, and the answer isn't to go in and, oh, what's it like for me to be in the middle of the fire, mm -hmm. right? And you need to know the difference between those situations because they have very different approaches. And so I'll we'll talk about things that you can do differently whenever you have a trauma field, as I'll talk about when we come back, versus um, just normal, everyday, emotional, differential, uh, derivative experiential content, as John Eisman would say, just normal, everyday, emotional stuff. So uh, we'll be back in a little bit. And thank you. This is Brett with The Connected Conversation. Hey, welcome back to The Connected Conversation. My name is Brent Hill, and we are talking about the tricky question of can mindfulness be harmful? Now, where we were left off was basically discussing what happens when you turn your attention inside and you go, oh, my God, it's too crazy in here. It's overwhelming. I don't want to go anywhere near what's actually happening in my world. Now, that's more like a trauma response, but it's actually, it, the, the way you can tell is it's literally overwhelming. And what there, now trauma is a completely different kind, not completely, it's all, all wounding is neurological, it, but it happens in a different place in your neurology. It happens in a lower part of your nervous system. And this gets into a discussion, which will just highlight of you know, the higher cognitive functions in the human neurology are, you know, things like attentions and making choices and sequencing things and deciding what's important to look at um, and, and be, you know, connected to. In other words, paying attention is really the most expensive thing that a human being can do. Now, what I mean by expensive is, I mean, it takes the most energy. So in this case, if you thought of it as money, you're spending most of, let's say you've got a thousand dollars in chips, right? And it takes, uh, it takes, a, a, you know, a $200 to pay attention to something on purpose, right? <laughs> so it's like, and let's just, let's make this even further, say it takes $200 every minute, right? So that means you can maybe pay attention to something on purpose for, for, you know, five minutes. And the truth is, it's actually more like 10 seconds or five seconds for most people. Um, but the your resources, your the neurological resources, the amount of energy that you have to pay attention to something on purpose is, is finite. And that and uh, as a result, it's very precious. Now it'll restock after a little bit. So what's that look like? Well, if you're doing a mindfulness practice, let's say you're doing a traditional uh, breathing meditation practice where you breathe and you bring your consciousness, your attention, your focus to your breath, and that's really strictly it. You just simply are paying attention to your breathing. So I'm, I'm breathing and you're noticing what's the air feel like, what's going on with my breath, the rise and fall of your breath of your chest, of your stomach, wherever you feel it, maybe tensions in your back. And you're just breathing. And that's really all you're doing, paying attention to your breathing. Now, this is a whole nother lesson here, which I don't want to go into too far because of time. 
but the body is always in the moment. Remember the, the definition on purpose. I'm going to choose to pay attention to my breathing. In the moment, the body is always in the moment. My breathing isn't happening tomorrow. It's not happening yesterday. I'm not thinking about, well, gee, I wonder if my breathing is any better if I did it. You're simply noticing. Noticing. Yeah, I'm breathing. It feels like this. Oh, I'm noticing that I'm breathing all from my upper chest. Okay, good noticing. What's, and you might experiment. What's it like to breathe in a more full-bodied way? Sure, play around with those things. But, you know, the first thing that happens is you notice what's actually going on. And then non-judgmentally, it's not like, oh, I'm breathing. I'm noticing I'm in my upper chest. Well, you know what? That's because I just feel like I don't really care. I'm so tense. And that's like, a, and that's being run away with. Now you're running away with your thoughts and you've lost the focus on your breathing. I'm not judging you. and. I'm advising people to not, don't be judgmental there. It's like, oh, I'm failed again. I can't do this. Just come back to your breathing. Just notice. Oh, yeah, I run away with my thoughts. Because you're going to. That is going to happen. You really only have, like I said, so much currency. You can only pay attention so much to your breathing. The purpose of this is to practice amping up that muscle of paying attention, creating literally creating the capacity to pay attention on purpose in the moment, not judgmentally. You're learning to ride the bike, and you're going to fall off. So what are you going to do? Just like riding a bike and falling off, are you going to get back up on the bike and keep riding? You're going to go, oh, you know, I don't like this falling off. That's not fun, and walk away. You can. Many people do. And if you do walk away, I'm not going to judge you for that. It's It's just like but what you miss is the opportunity to add a skill like bike riding to your, you know, your to your life, which lets you go places you could never go before and have really, really different experiences, expands your range as a human being, gives you a whole much bigger experience of life. That's a good thing. And it takes some work. Mindfulness is, is like that. You can go places you couldn't go. You can have experiences you couldn't have. You can connect in ways you could connect. So you're breathing, you're noticing. Now, in a trauma situation, what happens is you start to turn to this inward sensation and you start to have feelings that are not just simply unpleasant, but they feel terrifying or completely overwhelming. Now, there's a little bit of a gray zone here because a person can have sadness, like they've been just holding up the dam of sadness and they turn inside and they realize, oh my God, and that sadness can just move through and you feel better after expressing it. But after a trauma situation, you don't necessarily feel better after expressing it. It's just, it feels overwhelming and it can happen again at any moment if you go back into that situation. Now, that's the situation, if that's happening, where you get these overwhelming fear, overwhelming emotions that literally take over your body when you begin to turn inside, that would be a situation where I would say mindfulness and its traditional approach of turning inward to your senses and paying attention would not be necessarily the best idea for you. What do you do instead? You stop before the overwhelm. You stop before the overwhelm. And this is a little bit tricky because, like I said, there's there's the kind of emotional release that's just sort of pent up and you let it go and it moves through and you feel better. That would be something that would be good to just kind of let the pressure off. Uh, however, it's if it's if it's the kind of thing that just recurs over and over and over again, and it has a similar sort of pattern, then not. You, now, I want to address um, you. We've all seen, you know, because of movies and television like PTSD scenarios where people have these recurring sort of flashback situations due to, you know, very frequently associated with like battlefield woundedness or scenarios and these kinds of things do happen. And so, um, and the, they're very patterned experiences often. And, and I, I don't have that particular, but I have a couple of them. Um, 
that go through the same sequence once they fire. And once you're in them, you don't have any choices but to simply walk through the scenario as unpleasant as it is, and they're exceptionally unpleasant, um, and let it play itself out, and then de-stress it, you know, then kind of come back to a normalized state after a while. But the, what we want to do is help, if I'm a mindfulness coach or I'm helping someone be mindful, I want to pay very close attention to, is this just normal emotional pent up feeling that isn't pleasant or is this trauma? And if it's trauma, then I want to stop and say, we don't want to trigger the overwhelm because reliving that reinforces it. There was a time whenever, when in, in, in the work with trauma where they were like, um, oh yeah, you can like kind of let all the, the energy out of it by doing it over, you, you desensitize, but that's all changed now. The research shows that instead you amplify it because you reinforce the neural networks of the trauma situation by triggering it over and over again, you make it stronger. And so it doesn't get less through exposure. Instead, the way it gets less is by doing something different. And so that now, and that starts getting into how do you treat a traumatic experience? And that's not in my expertise. And I would refer you to a good somatic mindful practitioner of some kind who's who specializes in trauma work. Um, and there are quite a few out there. You can you'll look under, you know, somatic trauma therapists. And um that's my very best advice for somebody in terms of actually trying to heal um trauma within a human being and um this this isn't something you just have to live with forever and maybe some of you are going oh my god but i want you to know that that's true that there is help out there now in terms of mindfulness practice what you can is there is there does that mean it's completely off the table absolutely not you have to do things a little differently though so as someone who helps people in becoming more mindful in their work and in their life, and in my particular work in conversation, <laughs> that's one of the things I would do is I would direct people to do interactive mindfulness more so than um, turning inward and pure intrapsychic, as it might be called, in internal reflection. If that's what's triggering you, instead, I would say, let's do interactive work. So I might say something is um, let's find experiences in your world that are good, that you like, that feel yummy, that feel rich. And this is an entire practice that I teach uh, to all of my clients and then also uh, in the Mindful Coach Method, which is to notice when you light up, notice what makes you feel good. Notice when you go, wow, that is just amazing. I love that so much. What could it be? What is it? And we all tend to have something like that. Maybe it's, you know, nature, a sunset, a flower, a tree, a puppy, music, dance. What is it that makes you feel good? And I'm going to then advise someone who maybe has a trauma problem doing the inside to connect with that resource to connect with the goodness of that in a very refined way. So instead of taking our refined, open, aware, non-judgmental in the moment focus and turning it inward, we're going to take that same in the moment, non-judgmental awareness and put it into what am I experiencing in the world that feels good? That's a huge difference. And it's straight up mindfulness. Big, big deal. We'll talk some more about that when we come back. This is Brett Hill with The Connected Conversation. Hi, this is Brett Hill with The Connected Conversation, and we are talking about the deep, challenging topic of can mindfulness be harmful? So far, we've been talking about how when you turn inside, sometimes what's going on in there can be a little unpleasant and scary. And, and that's a very different feeling than when you turn inside and you're, you know, doing a mindfulness practice of some kind 
and it's literally overwhelming and you know you you feel out of control and taken over by a storm that then floods your your senses and you literally are then swept away by uh, your response to what's going on in that case your you've your trauma situation has been um triggered and there is a completely different world for a person in those scenarios. You, so if you've ever been around somebody who's experiencing a trauma event, you know, you can't, you can't just talk to them about, hey, just do something different. Why don't you just relax, you know, because the part of them that has the power to do that is not online. <laughs> they have been taken over by the trauma field, the trauma experience, and neurologically something is happening that basically disconnects the ability to have a um, an intervention come from within, like, oh, I, I see I'm having a strong feel, I'm going to do something really different now. That part of them is not there. It's just literally offline neurologically. And so you kind of, the best thing you can do is just be present for them and, uh, you know, support them in a way to keep them from, you know, as comfortable and, 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 um, as you can, uh, and just realize it's a limited window, it will end. Um, and I want to restate that I am not a trauma specialist, but um, that's the way that uh, I approach these topics and I have studied trauma and trauma interactions from a psychotherapeutic point of view uh, in somatic mindful techniques and some from some really fabulous people. One of the things that they talk about, if you go and you you take a class on trauma informed mindfulness uh, or some other course on mindful or on trauma, they talk about a thing called the window of tolerance. Now, the window of tolerance is the zone that you have before the trauma field kicks in and takes over your nervous system. So. Uh, a very, very strong trauma event might be if someone, like I mentioned before, uh, had had sort of an uh, accident where uh, one of the more common ones, you know, in the last 10 or 20 years has been soldiers who've been in, in explosions due to uh, improvised explosive devices. And so they blow up and they're near them or their friends were near them. And there's this gigantic percussion. There's this maybe concussion, uh, you know, sound, blinded, just literally an assault on your nervous system uh, of, you know, that's out of control um, and potentially physical damage to you and to others. So there's kind of, I'm just going to call it horror of being in a situation like that. That's just true, you know, a true horror scene, not the, the made up kind, but actual real battlefield stuff going on. And the body, when you're in that state, encodes all this stuff in a way really differently than it does a normal you know, somebody walks up to you and says, well, I don't like the way you, you know, did that last project, you know, very, very different situation. Now, when they're very strong, and coding is very strong, it doesn't take much of a trigger to trigger it. So they're walking down the street and a car backfires and they hear a boom and boom. There's a sense of, oh my God, that's like your brain goes, danger, 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 you know, and it's such an intense danger the nervous system can actually just lose control and surrender to the fact that this is this is what's happening and you just get you it's just you're just gone you're lost in the mem the sense of memory of this this traumatic experience that's a very very difficult situation to work with that's a little bit different now in that case the window of tolerance is like very very narrow in the sense of like i heard the sound i'm in the i'm in the trauma the work in this case with most normal call normal traumas, which aren't quite as severe as that, is that you can kind of approach and kind of starts to feel like, you know, I can tell this is jangle. I'm getting jangle. I start to feeling really jittery and jangly. I don't really want to go there. That's where you press pause. And so my, my, my wish for you, if you're someone who has a trauma in your life of some kind, is for one, 
to recognize that it's not the same as just normal emotional wounding and that you have to deal with it differently. Um, so when you start to feel that you're going to be overwhelmed by these by this experience, you you pause and you go, um, I'm not going to go there. And you take a breath and relax and you hang out and I'm okay now. I'm okay now. I'm not actually in that. Whatever the trauma experience was is not happening now. It's just a memory. The more you can do that, the you begin to develop a capacity to consciously, intentionally improve your window of tolerance. Now, another way you can do this is by not engaging this the work that the, the kinds of things that actually trigger it, but instead do different kinds of mindfulness practices that resource you, which is what I was talking about before the break. Instead, you connect intentionally on purpose in the moment to things that feel great, that don't trigger you. Like, you know, whatever it is that lights you up. I love dogs. I love animals. And so I can see almost any kind of dog and something in me goes, yay, I love dogs. Look at that one. He's so cool. Because they're all our characters. They're all just special characters to me. And so I notice that in myself and I actually take a breath and let myself have that feeling. And so that's the thing is give yourself permission to feel good about what you feel good about. Really let it go in. Let it really be. And I don't mean like make it more than it is, but let it be what it is. You notice a beautiful sunset, a beautiful sky, intentionally on purpose in the moment go, oh, I'm just going to let that be beautiful. I'm just going to hang out with what's it like for me to experience the beauty of this moment? How deep can that go? And if you just let that in and let that really be a resource for you, you begin to wire up your a mindfulness. This is straight up mindfulness, but it's not the inward focus kind. You're focusing outwardly and noticing how that impacts you inwardly. And, if, and it's not triggering, hopefully. If it is triggering, then you notice that, oh, yeah, even this is being... In that case, you know, you've got to do some work and find some people that can help you. But in many, many cases, there's something in your world that you can appreciate, love, adore, take in that feels great, that isn't in the zone of the neural network, the memory, the sense memory that triggers you. And you, so you really want to learn to land in those things and and make them an ally in your life. Make them a resource, a bastion of, of strength that you can learn to embody so that whenever you do get under some stress, you have this practiced resilience, this sense of memory of, you know, I'm someone who's connected to all this goodness in the world. Then whenever you encounter something that isn't good, either internally or externally, it you have this, that is a resource that you bring to your moment. And that way you can enter into some kind of challenging struggle, challenging struggles in a much more resource place. This is what I say in, in the Mindful Coach Method, which I teach to coaches, is that your problems don't go away. They just get smaller because you get bigger. It's almost like, you know, you, 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 you're you bringing much more than, oh, what's going on here? And you just walk into a room and you only have what you've had the last five seconds to be a resource. Instead, you have connection to something much more foundational, something much stronger. And that's the ability to connect to the goodness in things wherever you find it. The skill becomes translated to not only you know animals dogs skies rainbows flowers and i'm not trying to say you're escaping from the bad stuff but you don't want to not let that be present in your life as well so here's something it's like in a world with unlimited struggles and unlimited difficulty because there's so much of it and in and also, 
there is so much beauty and grace and compassion in the world. Unlimited amounts of that. So in a world with unlimited difficulty and a world with unlimited beauty, who do you choose to be with limited time? You've only got a lifetime. You can be. So who do you choose to be given that, that that's our lives, right? And so my wish for you is that you can be in beauty and grace when you choose to be, and that you can learn to find ways to be more present and powerful in ways you can't even imagine through practicing some mindful communications. So thank you. This is Brett Hill with The Connected Conversation, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us today on The Connected Conversation with Brett Hill on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in next time to experience the power of mindful communication to bring deeper meaning to your life, work, and the world. Brett is here to help you step into a life that works for you, to help you flourish and give voice to your natural creativity and purpose. See you here next time on The Connected Conversation to learn how to enjoy the experience of your moment-to-moment life. For more information, visit theconnectedconversation.com.